The song Somewhere Over the Rainbow is a favourite of many. The classic song was made popular by the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz and then made even more famous in 1993 by the ukulele player Brother Is. The two versions of the songs have inspired many other artists to also cover it and it's often a favourite in concerts and jam sessions. However, when you actually sit down and analyse the two recordings, you'll notice that they're quite different pieces of music. In fact, they're so different that the only thing that they share is the title and the lyrics. Therefore, I want to find out what is it that makes both of these quite different versions of the same song equally loved, and what sets them apart. Well, I think you'll agree that the most notable difference between the two versions is the instrumentation. Of course, Judy Garland's Wizard of Oz version is for female soprano and an entire jazz orchestra behind it. Conversely, Izzy's version is for a male baritone, I think he's a baritone anyway, and a just a ukulele. The differences in orchestration and instrumentation, therefore, have a knock-on effect with all the other elements of the songs, like harmony, melody, timbral variety, texture, and so much more. Often the approach to tempo is different from orchestral musicians to sort of more pop and folk uh, ensembles. Orchestras are often led by either a soloist, in this case Judy Garland, and or the conductor as well. The conductor stands at the front of the orchestra, all eyes on them, and he uses his baton and his arms, and he controls the tempo, as well as other things, but uh, his main job is to control the tempo. Often orchestral music features something called a rubato, which is a sort of push-pull effect of the tempo, where you might slow down just a little bit, sort of highlight a really beautiful moment, before you then speed up and you play the next little section actually faster than you normally would, in order so that the time passed would be the same as if you just played it at tempo the whole way through. The use of the conductor makes rubato especially effective, especially when you don't have a drum kit keeping a steady beat like you do in pop music. In this case, Julie Garland would have, in the recording studio, sung how she wanted to sing the song, the conductor would have been listening to her, and then would have used his instincts and his anticipation in order to lead the orchestra, changing the tempo, not dramatically, not sort of going from really slow to really fast, but adding in subtle nuances and subtle sort of little moments of rubato to really bring out a sort of extra layer of emotion and expression. Conversely, Izzy's version is at a constant tempo throughout. There is no rubato in this piece whatsoever. Instead, Izzy uses the more sort of folk orientated tradition, whereby you stick at a constant beat, almost as if you're playing along to a metronome. This more steady tempo is more commonly found in folk music and especially rock music. In rock music, of course, you've got the drum kit. Now it's interesting because the drum kit sits at the back of the ensemble rather than standing at the front like a conductor does. Therefore, this implies that a rock band uh, just sort of rely on the drummer to just do a steady beat, be sort of reliable and consistent, and then it's actually the lead players and the guitar players that actually control everything and sort of indicate what's going on in the song. Likewise in folk music, especially a lot of folk dancers as well, the need for a constant steady beat is 100% necessary when obviously dancing, everyone's got to move at the same tempo. And in folk music as well, there's often a lot of encouragement from artists to bring the audience in, to sing along with them. And the best way to do that is to maintain a steady pulse so that an audience, if they know the words and they know the tune, they're able to sing along without having to sort of, you know, uh, anticipate and follow any sort of tempo rhythm changes. It's just a lot easier to sing along to a steady beat than have some sort of guy waving his arms about telling you what to do. Therefore you find in a lot of folk music the tempo remains consistent, especially considering that Iz would have of course performed this song live and therefore encouraged his audience to sing along, sort of like you know either at a concert or sort of round a sort of campfire if you like. This is different, of course, to Judy Garland's version, where it's in a film, so obviously she can't interact with the audience, so the audience can't really sing along, they are just sort of given what they're, uh, you know, what's being presented to them on the screen.
Listen to these two snippets of the recording. I can't play these snippets for very long, unfortunately, for copyright reasons, but just sort of pay attention to the beat and notice the use of rubato in Judy Garland's version to highlight extra emotion, uh, compared to the steady beat of Izzy's music, which relates more back to folk tradition where an audience might be invited to join in. also allows for more extensive harmony as well, both in the chord progressions and actually the types of chords that you hear as well. If you think about a 100-piece orchestra, then theoretically every instrument could play one note to each and you'd actually be able to play the entire range of human hearing with some instruments to spare. Obviously you wouldn't do that in real life, but this flexibility is far greater than the ukulele, which just has four strings to play with, meaning it can only play four notes at a time. The film version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow makes use of this flexibility, incorporating lots of ninths and elevenths chords. The use of extensions such as ninths and elevenths really brings out the nature of this song in a sort of bittersweet, mellow, sort of yearning way. The dissonances sounding nice, but not quite resolved. You've got violin sections playing all sorts of different intertwining melodies that come together to create some really nice and really sort of quite packed harmony. By contrast, the ukulele can only play four notes, and Ears doesn't use a single extension in his chord progressions at all. In fact, he just plays three note triads. So these are just chords like C or A minor, things like that. There's no sort of extra number to them. Even when Iz plays the occasional spicy chord, such as the F add 9, it only lasts for one bar, and there's still uh, maybe only three notes in that chord. A, C, and G, and then another A. So he deliberately chooses not to go down the route of uh, creating extensions. This, I believe, is again more accustomed to folk music, where a folk musician would learn all their chords off by heart, and it's easier to jam and memorise chords if they're just the simple ones, you know, with the shorter names, like G, C, E minor. Instead of having to memorise and play difficult shapes, like, uh, what is that? C augmented sharp 9? You know, so you, just, you don't get those types of jazz chords in folk music. Izzy's version is definitely a folk song, and so he uses more stripped-back harmony in keeping with the genre. The chord progressions are different as well. In the Garland version, if you listen to it and actually try and play along, you'll find there are lots of extra chords that aren't in the ukulele version. In fact, there'll be some moments that are the same lyrically and structurally, such as two bridges, but they actually have different chords in each bridge. So the first bridge doesn't have uh, a diminished chord in, but the second one does. There's a diminished seventh in there, which creates some real tension and heightens the drama of the song. Where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney tops, that's where... Conversely, Issy's version tends to stick to a repeated sort of four chord like cycle. Um, the, chord, the cycle itself changes between the sections, but the principle of just playing four chords around and around and around doesn't change throughout. Of course, Is again is going back to that folk tradition of just playing a small number of chords repeated round and round. Folk music is often orally learnt, and if you go to a folk jam session, for example, uh, someone will just call out four chords and then everyone goes round and round and round. You don't want to be, you know, waffling out, oh, you know, and then in bar 59, remember to add this and that, and then in 68, do this, you know. You don't want to get into all those complications and things. You just want to stick to the basics in folk music. So, in keeping with the genre, is chooses to strip back the an amount of chords that he plays and just plays a simple four bar repeated progression which is obviously a lot easier to play in a folk scenario. 
This is of course unlike orchestral music, where every single musician in the orchestra has a sheet in front of them, so they have absolutely no need to memorise things, which is how the composer or the arranger gets away with such extensive use of harmony. The last thing I wanted to talk about, the sort of last major point that uh, describes the differences between these two versions of the song, is the melody. Now, in the 1939 orchestral version, Garland sings that really iconic octave leap as the first two notes in every single verse. Somewhere over the rainbow. That octave leap is really sort of even operatic if you want to go down that route. It's really sort of impressive and leaves a real statement and it's become one of the most famous uses of the octave interval in all of music. Traditionally, vocal lines are what they call conjunct. This is where all the notes are next to each other, or next but one, and so it creates a really nice smooth vocal line, which is easier to sing than sort of big jumps. So notes in, like, if you were to play a C note, then it's really likely that one of the next notes will be a D, E, A, B, you know, sort of that sort of area. It's very unlikely that you'll get a jump of, say, a ninth. So like a C all the way up to the D above. While these big gaps are almost impossible to sing, they can be impressive if pulled off correctly. And so big leaps in especially opera, they are used to help show off the singer's vocal technique. Listen to any sort of opera, maybe Pavarotti or something, and the most impressive moments always feature sort of big gaps in the vocal line. This is what we call disjunct melody, as opposed to the conjunct melody where all the notes are smooth. Therefore, the opening of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, that big octave jump, is really impressive, operatic, and it stays with you, and it's what makes this version of the song so memorable. It's weird, therefore, that Israel would choose to omit this uh, really famous melody line. Listen to the beginning of the first verse. You'll notice that he just sings a unison. He sings the same note, which is actually just two C's. The reason for this goes back to those folk roots that we've been talking about in this video. Like I just said, vocal lines typically are conjunct, and it's only really the professionals who can tackle big disjunct leaps with any sort of confidence and success. Therefore, in a folk example, where you've just got friends and family around the campfire, for example, or at a concert where you've got untrained pe people there, then you're very unlikely to expect them to be able to pull off an octave leap every single time that that verse comes around. Therefore, the use of the unison, just staying on the same note instead of doing the, the big leap, is, uh, it encourages the, the audience to be able to sing along because the line is easier for them to produce. Who cares if you're singing the correct melody? It's cool, man. Just sing whatever you want. As long as there's a big sense of community and sort of, you know, a warm love about the piece, then everyone's enjoying themselves and you can't criticise that. To conclude, therefore, I would definitely say that the Israel Kamaka... No, um, <laughs> I would definitely say that the ukulele version of that song is definitely more restricted. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's worse than its orchestral counterpart. Both versions of the songs are great examples of their respective genres, sort of jazz, opera, sort of musical style, versus folk, and especially Hawaiian, music roots. It really does show you how less is more. And I just find it interesting how the harmony, texture, melody, rhythm, tempo, uh, instrumentation, uh, structure, all of these things can be completely different between two versions of a song yet they're still regarded as the same piece of music. I hope this video has given you some inspiration into your own arrangements of songs. Instead of trying to replicate an exact sort of uh, impression of your favourite tune, why don't you go in the complete opposite direction and put that song into a genre of your own? It's really fun to see how much you can change a song and uh, turn it into something else, yet still sort of capturing the essence of the original. See uh, what the basics are. You only need a, just a couple of chords and some passion to make your song successful. 
That said, of course, big orchestral arrangements are great too. And it just shows you how there's no right or wrong way to play things in music. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've just recently hit 200 subscribers, or just over 200. I'd like to thank everyone who subscribed to me. There will be a 200 subscriber special video coming out as soon as I work out what it'll actually be. <laughs> uh, look out for that soon. If you're not subscribed, please do join the other 200 wonderful people where you can catch more of these videos. I do videos on a Monday, which is tuition or theory videos like this one. On Wednesday, I do live performances, and on Friday, I do miscellaneous things like news updates or sort of extra recordings and things that I've done. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon so you get notified whenever I release a new video. Why don't you join me on Patreon, where for just a few pounds a month you can get my videos early and receive extra bonus content too. Alternatively, like this video, share it with your friends, and head over to Matthew Quilliam website, www.matthewquilliam.co.uk, where you can find out more information, such as my ukulele tuition and also gig dates. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you have a great rest of your day.